All right. Xin chào Vietnam, Mabuhai Philippines, and hello to everybody else. Uh, welcome to the next episode of HR What's Next. All right. Uh, intro to me, my name is Jamie from Move Up, and I'm going to be your, your host for today. Now, we want this to be an interactive session. Okay. So, everyone watching in the comment section on Facebook, please write where are you watching from today? Uh, what city, what country are you watching from? Um, last time we had people from Philippines, Vietnam, Thailand. So we'd love to find out where you guys are watching from today. Um, if this is your first time joining us, this is not a one-time session. We are here the same time every week. All right. Uh, Tuesdays at 2 p.m. Vietnam, Thailand time or uh, 3 p.m. Philippines time. All right. So on to the topic for today. Um, our speaker, Mr. David McCann, uh, is one that I've been really, really excited for since he signed up for this series. Um, David actually joined us previously, and I can tell you he is a fantastic speaker. Now, for the topic, when we're working remotely, and I think uh, everyone is probably guilty of this, we can take on a lot of work for ourselves, right? And what David is going to be talking about today is how we can use delegation, not only to you know, reduce our own workload, but also to engage uh, with your employees. So um, some more about that later, David will be sharing and uh, you will be able to ask him questions. Okay, so please think of some questions whilst David is giving his presentation a bit later in the program. But before that, I'd like to give you a quick message from our co-organizer, Praxis. So Praxis are a virtual events consultant, and they are offering uh, free consultations. So if you need help with your online events, be that uh, online conferences, uh, meetings, or maybe you guys want to create a webinar like ours, um, please get in touch with Praxis. They are fantastic. Um, you can reach them on info at praxis.ph, or you can reach out to them also on social media. All right. Now, I'd like to offer a special thank you to all of our partners um, who are helping to organize this event. I can see the comment section is exploding today as well. So a shout out to everyone in, and watching live on Facebook. Um, so a big thank you to HR Calabrazon, um, to uh, ASEAN HR Leader Circle, uh, Marketing in Vietnam, um, Learning Synergies, Waku Sep. Thank you to HR Tech Asia, Working Mom, John Digital, Fixer, and the Society for the Advancement of HR in the Philippines. Thank you to Ms. Rona for that one. Um, extra special thank you, of course, to our co-organizers for this series, which are um, my team, Move Up, um, Praxis Associates Philippines, Uprush, and to Jandy. So thank you to all our partners for helping to produce uh, this series. All right. And... Thank you. Yes, we do have a prize available for today's session. Like always, we always like to give away a prize. So the value of today's prize is 25,000 Philippine pesos. Today, you will get it for free. Okay, you just need to wait for my question, which will be after the Q&A section of the program. Now, this will give you access to all our master classes that we have co-produced with leading coaches and trainers right here in Ho Chi Minh City. All right, so stay tuned for some more information on that one. If you would like to purchase um, access to the masterclasses, if you're not lucky enough to be the winner, <clears throat> um, we have a special promo um, for a teacher's month, which we've now extended for the duration of this series to give everybody a chance to, uh, to get this um, access for our masterclasses at this low price. So um, if you'd like some more information on this, head to prx.ph slash teachers promo. That's prx.ph slash teachers promo. Okay. Now, um, I do have a fantastic correspondent. I think I only have one today um, looking after me. So um, my name is Jamie. I'm going to be the moderator. And uh, in, the, in the wings today, we have the job of technical correspondent, which falls to Miss Tony, just meet you today, Tony. Yep, it's okay. <laughs> we can get this through. <laughs> we can, we can do this. Yep, 
Anyway, thank you, Jamie. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon, David. And thank you for being with us today and good to have you back as our speaker. And I'm really excited to listen to your talk. So before I get into more details, I would like to show what we do in practice aside from being a virtual events consultant in transforming ideas into reality. So please watch this video. Okay, so um, as Jamie said earlier, we are currently live on different Facebook pages and groups. So if you have questions to our speaker or if you have an insight to share to your, um, to your call audience, then just type them on the comments below. And if you're watching from, the face, from a Facebook group and if you want your comment to show up in the broadcast, make sure to access this link. That's erx.ph slash syfb and link our streaming platform to Facebook. So that's it for me, Jamie. Are you still there? Okay. Yes. <laughs> I'm, st I'm still here. So be before we go into the next part, let's see why um, people all over Asia are using Jandy. Okay, so thank you to our co-organizer, Jandy, for that one. Okay, now we're coming to the main part of today's session. So if you are ready to learn about employee engagement, please write ready in the chat box. Again, if you are ready to learn, please write ready in the chat box. Now, I'm going to give you a brief introduction to our fantastic speaker who we have for today. So uh, David McCann, he spent um, 15 years working in Canadian financial services uh, with uh, sales, marketing, products, and training teams before he moved to Asia and found his company, BCX Design. Uh, David's work has focused on applying behavioral, pardon me, behavioral science principles um, to the challenges faced by us and organizations. And in 2015, David struck out on his own first in Thailand and in um, India, sorry. And then he ended up moving to Thailand. Now, his insights, his training sessions, and strategic consulting services yields substantial change in the behaviors of your internal and external audiences. And I, I, I can I can vouch for this one as well. So here to talk about employee engagement. A focus on delegation is Mr. David McCann. Thank you so much for that awesome introduction, Jamie. <laughs> You're very welcome, sir. Um, I will let you take it from here. Fabulous. So first, let's let's get some of the some of the important details. Thank you for supporting this channel. The HR HR What's Next series has been a real lifeline for for many people around the region. Uh, Southeast Asia and even some outside of the region as well. So this is a, a really great channel. Thank you for coming. So as as Jamie was saying, my name is David and I'm a Canadian. And many moons ago, I moved to Bangalore in India, spent four years there before I moved to Bangkok in the beginning of the year, just before COVID locked down the world. So my experience with the region has been somewhat different than, uh, than I think might have been the case. But 
what I wanted to share with you all today within this topic of employee engagement is how we delegate, why, let me rephrase this, why we struggle to delegate. One of the biggest dreams I think that we have before we become a manager is, hey, once we become the boss, we're gonna have someone to give our work to, so life's gonna be easy. The truth is not so simple. And I think those of us that have become managers or managers of managers would, would understand quite well how difficult it can be sometimes to delegate work to others. So today's presentation, which I'm gonna pull up right now, is gonna to talk to a few of the reasons why we struggle. And I'll also provide you with some insights explaining what we can do to go about fixing this problem. Now, I'm gonna to talk to delegation in three categories. The first will be problems of the self, which I've called time and scarcity. Problems that prevent us from delegating that relate to the team, which I've called trust and pride. And problems that relate to the organization that might help or hinder a person in a managerial role from delegating work to others. In each category, we're gonna talk to some of the science behind the, the challenges then I'm gonna share some best practices in each category. This will be a, a review of what has worked in different countries and different organizations around the world. And I'm gonna throw a small little asterisk or caveat here. The way that behavioral science works is very context dependent. So what might have worked in Paris or New York might not work in Ho Chi Minh City or in Manila the way that we expect. We're mostly the same, whether we're American or French or Indian or Southeast Asian, we're mostly the same, but we are a little bit different. Now, after we talk about best practices, I wanna give you all something, uh, something useful that you could, you could use when you go to your, your job later today or tomorrow, when you go back to your team or back to your organization. So I'm gonna leave you with some very tactical things that you could do right away that would be uh, maybe more useful. And then finally, for those of you that are interested in the material, I'll, I'll show you where, uh, where you can get access to some of the reference material that I've used to create today's presentation for you. So let's talk about problem number one. These are problems of the self. So when we get really busy as, uh, you know, as a manager, and this would be a problem that would be particularly common when we're a new manager for the first time, when we're taking on a new team or we're moving into a new department with products and, and services and, and tasks that we're just not so familiar with. When you get into a role like that, into a situation like this, it can be very easy to, at the end of the day, having been given a whole slew of additional tasks to do, just to sit back in your chair and think, who am I gonna delegate this to? How am I gonna do it? Okay, I don't fully understand how this is supposed to happen. Okay, I'll just do it myself, it's easier. Now, I think those seasoned managers among us would know that this does happen often, but we also know up here, doing it yourself is a trap. It will cause us to continually have more work to do and we will wind up firefighting for much longer than we think we would. Now, that we understand that doesn't mean we don't do it anyway. And I think what tends to happen, not I think, what I know happens when we fall into that trap of doing all this additional work ourselves because we haven't got time or we don't think we have time to delegate it, we fall into this trap of believing that, you know what? If we put more hours into the problem, if we just work a bit extra overtime, we'll get our goals met. We'll get more work done. Now, this is a challenge that is, uh, let's just say, much more common in the technology world and far more common in the startup world. This is what I've seen working with startups and, and, and technology businesses across four continents. The evidence, though, suggests something quite different. The reality of it is over short periods of time, let's say a sprint, a month maybe, lots of overtime does in fact get more work done. Now, 
what's what's actually happened is our mind is 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 working harder to help us prioritize what to do and we become more task or goal oriented around the very specific or fewer things to do and this is where the term firefighting comes in we'll talk about this in a moment but what the evidence does show us is while over time in short bursts can get more work done it does not persist once we pull to a period of a quarter, we pull out a little bit, what we find is organizations across industries, manufacturing, software, financial services, pretty much everything, we don't get more work done by continuously working longer hours trying to solve problems or trying to get work done. And so what that's telling us is we need to learn how to delegate work more effectively so that we don't wind up in this trap of working so many hours. Now, let's spend a minute with, with the science and I'll explain what, what really is going on when we, when we get really overwhelmed and we haven't got enough time. Our mind is a great machine. It, it allows us to block out a whole bunch of noise around us it allows us to focus our cognitive capacity on a fewer number of goals. Some have called this the focusing dividend or tunneling. So what's actually happened is our mind is trying to help us get through a task as quickly and efficiently as possible. And so what happens is our, our mind uses our fixed cognitive bandwidth, which in plain language means this. We are all given a, a limited intelligence, a limited, a limited IQ, if you will, a limited ability to get a certain number of tasks done. Now, we're mostly quite brilliant people. We can get a lot done. But what happens when we focus on a specific problem because we're time starved is we pay what's called a tunneling tax. Now, think of it like this. If our IQ is 130, and we need to focus on one problem to the detriment of everything else, th this is not a lossless transaction as we move from full potential to focused potential. And what evidence shows us is when we are deprived of time or other resources and we focus exclusively on one problem, and we do this both consciously and subconsciously, so it's not entirely within our control, we are a little bit stupider. Our IQ drops on average 10 to 12 points. We forget more things that we're told and goals that should be maybe important are no longer as salient, meaning we don't pay much attention to them. And so what ends up happening is over prolonged periods of time, we become so task focused that when we could be doing multiple things at once, that might result in us getting a little bit worked in a little bit more slowly, which would ultimately wind up being the same amount of work over a longer period of time, that isn't what ends up happening. We end up spinning our wheels, working harder, just to achieve the same goals that we would achieve in the same amount of time. Now, what do we, what do we need to do here? What, what can be done? How can we delegate more work effectively, how can we prevent ourselves from falling into this trap of doing most of the work ourselves or doing too much of the work ourselves? How do we stop that from happening? Or if we're stuck in that trap, how do we, how do we get out? Well, let's talk first about some best practices. Now, the, the plain language here is we need something called a fault tolerant plan. Now, what does that mean? Well, what this means is, is really quite simple. We need slack. We need free time in the course of a week or a day to think. In fact, when surveys were done across four continents in about 15 countries, people were asked a question. If you had all the power and you could change something about your job, what would you change? And overwhelmingly, the answer came back consistently, I would create time for me to think. This is a particularly difficult challenge in knowledge fields for building software, or designing intellectual property. Time to think matters a lot more than you might think. 
Now, we need to create ourselves a plan that will create that slack, that will somehow give us that opportunity on a weekly basis or greater to sit back in your chair for a period of time, maybe half an hour, maybe an hour, that will allow you to think about your job, think about the work that you're doing, and give some thought to how you might be able to do it better or how it might how how you might be able to create something new. But that plan needs to be easy. So it doesn't need to be a PhD thesis. It needs to be easy for you to follow or you won't use it or you won't spend the time to create it because you'll be too busy. That plan needs to be fault tolerant, meaning, listen, when we get really busy and when we are really busy people, really productive people, it's very easy for us to say yes to too many things to do too many things ourselves because we feel we can do it faster. And we're not gonna wave a magic wand with our plan and, and make us effective, efficient delegators who are able to say no to our bosses every time they try to give us too much work. That's not gonna happen. So we need a way for that plan to create buffer so that when things do happen, we can slide a little bit we can take one project too many, we can end up back in the trap and know that we have this plan to get us back out. That's what I mean by slack and being kind to yourself. We need to be able to create that time to think, yes, but we also need time to get that back if we, if we break a habit. Now, there's a real practical case study here which I think might make it a little bit clearer than my, my advice. There was a, a hospital in, in uh, Minnesota, in the United States, called St. John's Regional Health Center. And this organization had a major problem. They were a critical care facility, and they were, they were running their operating rooms at near 100% capacity, to the point where every time an unexpected event would take place, let's say a new emergency were, were to happen, what would happen is the doctor the nurse and some of the hospital administrative staff would scramble to reschedule uh, a surgery that had already been scheduled and booked for a specific operating room. And they'd been trying for years to pull themselves out of this problem. They were efficient people. They were not using more time or other resources to get these scheduled or emergency surgeries done. Their problem was they didn't have slack. So they, they thought, you know what, we need to spend money to, to build uh, new hospitals, to build new theaters, or we need to no longer be an emergency critical care facility. These were decisions that were running through their heads. So what they did is they brought in an outsider before they made any drastic decisions to look at their workflows. And what this consultant did was he said, listen, you need to have one operating room that is not you can't reserve, that will not be reservable, will only be for, for emergencies. And what this did at first was it made the administrators and the nurses and the doctors, it made them so angry and frustrated and anxious. You can imagine what would have been, what would have been happening. Doctors and, 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 and medical staff complaining, we haven't got enough space now and now you're taking away a room from us, what's gonna happen? Well, what actually happened when that slack was introduced, when that one room could no longer be reserved, they actually found an 11% increase in the number of surgeries that they were able to complete. Why? Very simple. They were no longer having to res reschedule nearly as many reserved surgeries. That created an enormous amount of capacity. That, or that constraint meant no more phone calls, no more running around to fix problems, no more anxiety slowing everybody down. They just knew that that was there and they could plan accordingly. So this is effectively what we need in our lives. If we're working 60, 50, 80 hours a week, chances are dedicating ourselves with a block of time for us to never be able to reserve, for just us to think or, or handle whatever crazy things happen in our lives will likely result in you getting more work done, not less, even though it might not feel that way. Now, that's high level. 
I promise tactical. How can we escape the trap? What can we do when we go back to the office or get to our desk today or tomorrow? Well, I've broken all of these advices here that I'm giving into two, a coping strategy and how to escape. The coping strategy is something we can do now. The escape strategy is something that might take a little bit more effort. But to cope with an inability to delegate or insufficient time to delegate, we can use what's called a Pomodoro technique. For those of you that are less familiar with it, I recommend you Google Pomodoro Tracker. You might find this to be valuable for yourself. But what we know is our IQ drops a little bit when we get overstretched and commit to doing too much work with insufficient time. And what that causes is for us to forget. So a Pomodoro Tracker will help you write down all the tasks you need to get done. So think of it like a, a calendar or a project tool, project management tool. The other thing that a Pomodoro Tracker does is it'll help us use the cognitive resources that we have a little bit more efficiently. So what we know is we can give full power, full cognitive focus to a task for a window of time. Thinking hard is more akin to running a sprint, not a marathon. So we can work at peak capacity for about 25 to 55 minutes at a stretch before we need a break. So if you work for 25 minutes straight, get up, walk around for five minutes, get back to work. You work for 55 minutes, maybe take 10 minutes off. Walk around, grab a coffee or a glass of water, go outside, get some sun. But the rhythm of our mind will will be better served by a technique where we are not always using full power the full day. We'll tire ourselves out, get less work done. So a Pomodoro technique is a nice crutch if it's gonna take you some time to get out of this trap you're in. The, the somewhat longer term fix and probably the better one is to build a type of automatic stabilizer in your life. It's, it's if you think of it a way of nudging yourself without having to train yourself or communicate differently. In this case, what you might do, if you have a, any project management software within your company, then what you can do is you can create your project management list, but then give yourself a notification. And if your software permits this, let your boss or your mentor or your team in when that work gets too much. You need to be able to ask for help. If it's your boss or your mentor, once that to-do pile, that you know number of deals you're working on or number of products you're working through or number of problems you are managing surfaces exceeds a certain level, time to go get some help. Maybe you can have some outsider tell you, hey, maybe we can delegate this, this, and that to somebody else. Maybe you can ask your team to take some things off your plate. Whatever it is, if you want to give yourself a way to, to have a release valve in the event that that workload gets too high, an automatic stabilizer is a good way to do that. So those are what I call problems of the self, problems that are related to not enough time to delegate the problem, which leads to a scarcity mindset, which makes us less capable. But perhaps the problem is not with time. Perhaps the problem, the reason that we're unable to delegate relates to our team. Perhaps we have a trust problem. Maybe we don't think the team has got the right motivation. They haven't bought in. They're not loving what the company's doing or the work that they're doing. Maybe it's motivation. Maybe the problem is capability. Maybe there's a, 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 lack, of, a lack of skill in the team for, for a, a couple of reasons that we'll get into. Either way, I think what would make some sense first is to talk a little bit about how we are motivated as humans. And I think that might help build a set of tools that would hopefully help you manage your team more effectively. So let's, let's talk about this. Probably motivational psychology's most famous contribution to the world of academia is what we're looking at here. It's called self-determination theory. 
Now, for those of you who took psychology in university, you might have come across Maslow's hierarchy of human needs. This is uh, more fundamental than that and more translatable across cultures. What we're looking at here is something that I hope will help restore some of your trust in your fellow humans. Absent an underlying problem, they don't like you, they don't like the company, or there's some other problem in their lives that you haven't found out about yet. This is how we are all wired and why we should think good of people when we're trying to manage them. We're all motivated by three things. We want and need competence. So to start from early childhood, we're three years old, around the time our first memories begin to, begin to form. This is about the earliest that most of us are able to remember. We seek competence, meaning we want to pick the food that we eat. This is one of the reasons that young children will sit at a table and have fights with their parents and throw and have fits and get upset because they don't want to eat the peas or they don't want to eat the carrots. This is a child demonstrating that they want to be able to have a degree of autonomy, which we'll talk about in a moment, but also have a degree of competence. They want, if they're using a knife and fork at this age, to be able to maybe cut the carrots or cut the potato. They want to be able to bring a help mom or help dad. And that extremely basic fundamental piece of our brain's wiring continues into adolescence and into adulthood. So the picture you're looking at here is of a, an adolescent young man working with his dad or his grandpa who is beginning to learn how to use this power tool in front of him. Now, he wants to do that. And like any other task, he, he doesn't necessarily want to become a master carpenter, but he wants to be able to use that tool with a level of competence. Our brains are actually wired this way. So the way that it works, if we think about this task or maybe uh, learning to drive a car or ride a bike, is it takes at first a great deal of effort, but our brains are well equipped to to have us learn new things. We're largely motivated to do that anyway, just intrinsically or internally. But we also want to get to a level of competence where we don't have to think so hard about how to do a certain task, like operate a saw or drive a car or a bike. And the way that this works is, for those of you that have, that have heard about the dual process theory of cognition or in plain language that we have two types of thinking, fast and slow, what, what's really happening is while we learn the task, it's effortful, it takes many calories to learn how to use the saw. But over a period of time, it won't be so effortful. He won't be so nervous and, and, and focused when he turns the saw on and puts the wood through it to cut. Eventually, he'll have competence and the task will be somewhat easier. And the mind prefers to operate in that mode, that fast or intuitive mode of thought. It takes fewer calories. We don't have to think as hard. We prefer that. And so when we move into the world of work, our employees, like any human anywhere in the world, seek to do a task with competence because it's easier. They prefer to work that way. Now, like the example that I gave earlier with the child refusing to eat the carrots or the peas or the potatoes because they're trying to demonstrate their autonomy, this continues to hold true into adolescence and into the world of work as well. Now, this does vary in, in countries like in Southeast Asia that are somewhat more collectivist versus countries that are more famously individualistic, like for example, the United States or maybe to a lesser degree, Canada. Uh, the degree of autonomy that we wish uh, may vary somewhat, but we seek agency. We want to be able to walk across the room without mom or dad helping us. We want to be able to eat what we want to eat and have some choice in what we eat. We also want to be able to do some work without somebody holding our hand or watching us closely. Now, this autonomy 
is important and will be a very useful tool for you, the manager. If your employees feel they cannot be autonomous, there's a good chance that both of you are unhappy. One, because they can't, and two, because you're supervising so much that you have too much work to do. So autonomy and agency are important as motivational drives. Now the third and, and potentially most useful when you're managing a team of the motivational drives is the drive for relatedness. We are social beings. We need to feel like we fit in. Well, we need to do more than that. We need to actually fit in. And to do that, we need to be of value to our peers. Now, that particular tool is, I think, one that you'll find really quite useful. So let's let's go through to some best practices. What what can we do? Now we've got a little bit of science behind the motivation of people. Let's talk a little bit about what do you do? What have been great solutions to not trusting the team because either you don't feel they're properly motivated or you don't feel that they have the right capabilities to get the job done. So let's pretend first that it's you. You're the problem. Now, if it is in fact a managerial challenge that is preventing you from trusting them enough to give them work and autonomy, well, there's, there's a few things that we can do. So first, we can start with why we're asking them to do this work. This is pretty classic stuff. Any of you who have listened to a Simon Sinek talk will know this, but we start with why. Where is the company going? Why does it want to go there? So what is the big thing that you solve? What, what, is the, uh, what is the plan you have to get to that place? So your destination and how you plan to get there. This is your starting with why. Now, you're doing this because you don't want to constantly have to use carrots and sticks to manage your employees. Ideally, they feel it intrinsically inside. They want to do what, where the company wants to go and how it wants to get there because they've bought in. So starting with why is pretty important. So let's pretend that you've done that, that they know what it is, but it's just not working. There's, there's something else going on. This one is tough, but not the hardest thing in the world. You need to let them know, particularly if your team is smart. And I would imagine that you hired smart people if you're working in a knowledge industry company, working in a knowledge, in the knowledge industry, sorry. I call this your red light, green light. But think of it this way. If you've got a team that's working together to solve some problems, whether it be project teams, engineering teams, sales or marketing teams, or HR teams, chances are, they have the ability to make decisions without you. They might not have the permission to do it. And so what happens when that's the case is you become the bottleneck, making you have to give, have to give answers to them far more frequently than might be necessary, which takes up even more of your time, which makes you get less work done and work more hours, which is a pretty crappy situation for everybody. So the solution here is to very clearly lay out your decision-making approach. That type of transparency, letting others know you and how you are going to see a problem and what you're gonna to need to do to get your boss to agree to a decision that you've made. If you're able to, tr to translate that transparently to your team, they will know what you expect before they come to you. And that will save you so much time and give them the autonomy that they want. Now, what this leaves is for you to do one of the hardest tasks for a manager. The hardest because it requires consistency. Once you've given the journey why you want to get there and you've given a transparent set of rules that need to be applied, you need to ensure that they're complying with your rules. And it's important that you do that because frankly, back to the example of, a ch of childhood, your young children are going to push the boundaries of what mom and dad say is okay and not okay. And they're gonna do that until mom and dad push back and set down some hard rules. Now, they might get upset. These kids, our kids might cry 
but they're not going to stop respecting mom and dad. In fact, this is how that respect gets earned. They learn that there are consequences and that there are rules. Now, not to be too patronizing, but we continue to need that type of authority throughout our entire lives, including in our work. We need that authority, that tension is A, what builds respect, but B, it's what, build, it's what helps with creativity. It's what helps with resiliency and it helps with trust building. They need to respect your authority. And at the same time, you giving them autonomy and decision-making criteria are giving both yourself and them methods for them to earn your trust and for you to gain theirs. This is what you do if the problem is with you. And I think for, for most people who have read some management literature, none of this should be terribly new. Now, on topic of new, maybe it's not you. Maybe you're great. Maybe you've, you've, set, you, you've, you've told everyone the destination, why you're going there. You've given them all the rules that they need to follow. You, you're trying to ensure, doing your best to ensure accountability and it's still not working. And, and maybe the reason for that is, well, maybe you got a lot of new people working for your company, or working for your team, I should say. So what do you do then? Well, this one's, I think, one of the more fun. So this is an example of training. Now, in theory, we all have HR teams who can help us deliver learning and development programs and help our people get up to speed. We can put together great databases of, of learning material and give them to our new employees and stick them in a corner and say, this is what you need to know. This is all good stuff, for sure. We need to be able to do this. But there's, there's something more that we can do. And this, frankly, this is a really great nudge, particularly if you have, uh, if you're onboarding new employees in a remote environment, as would be common today. Your newbies, need to know who their peers are. So this old trope that I think many of us might roll our eyes at a little tiny bit is the icebreaker. How do you get new people to make friends with each other? What you do is you need for your new employee to meet the team and understand a little bit about them as quickly as possible. So a, a short bio can be of help here. Uh, a quick video meetup where each colleague, new colleague, will tell the younger, newer employee who they are. And the younger, newer employee can tell the team who they are. Now, this is the reason that this is, is, is helpful and, and quite useful, in fact, is that principle of, re, of relatedness that motivates us as a very integral part of who we are. We need to fit in. We need to feel of value to our team. So one of the most important things you can do beyond introducing them is you can give them something to do on day one. Whatever mundane, small, hopefully annoying task that the rest of the team doesn't want to do or doesn't like to do, you can give them that task. When I was a banker, that task was opening savings accounts for new students. It was a, a product that carried no additional potential sale it took 20 minutes. There wasn't a lot of information to discover. It was a, an excellent first task to give an employee who was new on the very first day on the job. This endeared them a little bit to the team and it helped the new person better emulate the way of speaking and the mannerisms of others. If you think of it like everybody is really serious and stern on their first day and you're a new recent graduate, chances are that's going to make you emulate them in, in some small way as well, which will help you fit in and help them like you better, which will reduce some of the workload off of you. Now, the other somewhat old tool, but tremendously powerful is, well, maybe it's not that you've got a bunch of new people. Maybe your team's pretty seasoned. Maybe you're doing a great job as a manager but maybe you got skill gaps and maybe those skill gaps are uh, something that you're somewhat expert with and some of your team is, but some of the team is not. So in the picture we're looking at here, 
let's imagine that it's the younger guy on the left who is the mentor for the older guy on the right who does not have the new skill with some piece of software. So what we do here is you mentor the guy on the left. Maybe this guy on the left in the blue shirt, maybe he's beginning to show management potential. And, and maybe having him work with your guy that has the skill gap will A, get that skill gap covered for you, but B, help you reduce the work, reduce your own workload by having someone else take that task for you. There's a, a more significant benefit out there for any of you who've studied gamification. When you do something like this, the, the, experienced, the experienced employee will feel valued because he gets to pay forward his knowledge, which is a way for him to feel pride. And at the same time, the younger or less experienced employee on the right, who is learning how to deal, how to learn the new task, will more likely learn that skill more quickly than he would from you, because this guy is a colleague, and the risks associated with not understanding or or maybe messing up are lower with a mentor than they are with a boss. So he learns faster, the workload is reduced for you, and you get to make better use out of an employee who is seasoned. This seems like a win-win all around. Mentorship programs are great. They work incredibly well around the world, and I highly recommend them in our own work. So to conclude, I'll, I'll tell a short story, but actually let me tell the story first before I talk about how to conclude. So I mentioned pride, and many of you out there might not associate pride with a particularly positive emotion, and for the most part, I think you'd be right. But paying forward your knowledge and your expertise as a manager is perhaps one of the most powerful things that you can do, both A, to, to feel better uh, and, and just to be a good human being, but two, it will make you a far more effective and successful human being and manager by paying forward that knowledge. You'll feel good about it. And I'll, I'll tell you a story from one of my favorite professors. His name is David DeSteno, and he wrote a book called Gratitude, Compassion, and Pride. Now, these three emotions are what he described as the most powerful tools we have as human beings to get us through difficulty. If we're struggling for some long-term goal, we could use willpower to avoid eating cookies and chips and snacks as we, as we chase a, a great diet. But eventually, that willpower that we've used to resist the cookies or the chips will conclude and we'll end up eating far too much and our diet will get ruined and we'll completely fall off track. And so to, to illustrate this point through a, a short story, David or David DeSteno describes a, a very, very early stage of, of humanity, a time when we were hunting animals with, uh, uh, when, we were, when we were hunting animals with sticks, uh, spears, and where we were gathering berries and small fruits and nuts from the forest. Now, if you, rem if you think you're, if you put yourself in this situation, think back to uh, this type of movie scene if you haven't, uh, if, you, if you struggle, but imagine yourself being the bad hunter. Imagine yourself going out with your hunting peers and them ridiculing you, making fun of you for, for, for being a bad hunter. And this is happening season after season, and one season you're dejected, feeling sorry for yourself, sitting outside your hut all by yourself. And you kick some, you're just kicking some dirt around, and you notice that you kicked some seeds into the ground and some water fell into it. And wow, you, you managed to grow some potatoes. You only grew a few, like maybe two or three plants, but that was interesting. And so you continue to, you know, try to plant some more of these things. You kick some more seeds, and over the seasons, Eventually, you wind up with a field full of potatoes, and all the while, your your hunting peers have been have been ridiculing you. But as you stood back and looked at your field one day, you crossed your arms and and stared back and and stared out and looked at what you'd done, and you felt pride. Look at what I have done. 
Look at what my efforts have wrought. Wow. But then a season or two later, the hunt fails. Your, your hunters are not able to get any meat and they come to you and very sorrowfully, shamefacedly say, we're, we're going to starve unless, unless you help us. Can, can, we, can we have some of your potatoes? And so you show compassion. You share, the, you share the crop with your villagers. But you do more than that. You also pay forward what you've learned. You teach others how to grow potatoes. And so several more seasons pass, and you look out at the village that is now surrounded by potato fields and other vegetables. And it's a much more successful, thriving place. There's more children, and everybody is generally more successful. And you think back to first having learned how to plant potatoes and then to being able to show everyone else how it's done. And you feel grateful that you were able to do that for your village. And this is the source of our resiliency. This is one of the ways that humans have learned over the millennia to pay forward what they've learned. We're rewarded when we do that. And so as a manager, you fought a very hard battle to get to the role that you're in today. You're legitimately proud of what you've learned to do. Show compassion for your team, pay forward what you've learned, be grateful that you're afforded the opportunity to do that. And you not only will be more resilient, you'll also find the ways you need to find to work fewer hours and get more work done and just be a better human being. So hopefully that was useful. Those are the problems that relate to the team. Know that if you've got trust problems, unless there are underlying challenges, if your team doesn't like you for some reason, chances are they're good people who are motivated to do work because we all need to feel competent, we all need a degree of autonomy or agency, and we all need to feel like we belong. But that may not be all there is to the story. It might be difficult for us to delegate to employees because the organization gets in the way sometimes. So let's, let's just take a, a few minutes to close it out here around, well, what if it's the culture? What if we have challenges managing our workloads because our, our bosses or peers make it difficult to do that? And I'm gonna take aim at what I think is probably one of the bigger challenges that, that we're, we're facing and experimenting with around the world. And that is the always on culture. Now, I've worked in industries that for short stints will work obscene hours, 70 hours in a week around a, you know, a particular time of year as a banker, that'd be tax time. But I've also worked in organizations that constantly work with an always on culture. Now, what we've also seen in this is COVID has shown us how susceptible we are to falling into that trap of always working. We talked about problems of, we've talked about this already in problems of the self that working more hours does not equal more productivity over prolonged periods of time. We're able to, we're able to sustain it for maybe a month at best until eventually we just end up working more hours but not getting more done. Now, what COVID and these, this remote working, uh, remote working fact of life has shown us is we can just as easily be working at 8 p.m. or you know 4 a.m. It, it doesn't matter, we're home and we can get work done no matter what. Now, one of the challenges with that is the type of communications infrastructure that we now have available to us. So let me, let me list four of them. If you were North American, uh, you would have grown up with voicemail. Now with voicemail, there's an expectation that you respond same day. If Mr. Customer leaves you a message that way, you'll at least call him or her back to say, hey, I'm sorry I couldn't get to you, I'll call you back tomorrow. That's the expectation with voicemail. Email is similar. 
there there's an expectation that you respond at least same day, but ideally within within a few hours to anything that gets sent out. With instant messaging technologies, though, that's not the case. We haven't exactly got ourselves sorted with what an acceptable response time is, but it's fair to say that instant messaging through Slack or WhatsApp or Google Chat or whatever service you use comes with and it comes with it an expectation that will respond much much sooner. Now, what happens in the always on culture is you'll often get a boss who's to use an American expression, woke. She'll know, hey, just because I'm working Saturday night because I got nothing else to do and I love this business and I send you a message, I do not expect for you to respond to that message, whether it's voicemail, email, instant message. The truth is that is not what's going to happen. Here's what we know. We know that we're pretty easily distracted. If something's salient, we're going to end up focusing on it. And let me let me set a scene to, to help you better understand this point. Let's imagine you're with your partner and you're you're making dinner. It's Saturday night, you're you're having a glass of wine, you've you've you finally managed to to just be present and enjoy that moment, having some wine, listening to some music, cooking. You get an instant message from your boss. Your phone is there because you're playing some music and your phone's always with you anyway, so you see it. Now you remember your boss said, hey, listen, you don't need to respond to me outside of business hours, but I work this way, so just forget it. Forgive me and ignore it. You can deal with it when the workday starts. I won't expect you to, to deal with it. But here's what's gonna happen. It takes on average 23 minutes for us to regain that presence that we had with our partner in that moment making that dinner. We're not gonna be distracted thinking about the world of work for 23 minutes on average. And so what happens now is this snowballs. If you're a manager and you have that same philosophy of, listen, I'm gonna work what hours I choose because it works for me, I'm gonna take some breaks during the middle of the day, whatever. What's gonna happen is even if your team is only on the clock for the standard nine to five, 40 hours a week, every time you send a message outside of work hours, you've just added 20, 23 minutes worth of additional work time that that person's gonna be thinking about work and not their personal life. And all we know happens when, that, when you have a prolonged window of time like that, when you communicate like that, is we work more hours and get no work done no additional work done. That sucks. That really sucks. Why would anybody want to work more and not get more done? That's a Sisyphean task. That's just not smart. But we all fall into the trap. So that's a problem that we, we need to be able to think about. But the funny thing is, we've known about this for like 100 years. Here's a story. We might have forgotten. I'll give you two stories, one that's old and one that's modern. On your left is a Ford Model T, the first mass produced vehicle in the world. Now, Ford for about 12 years had been experimenting with ways to assemble his vehicles so he could get them to be as, as efficient as possible. The assembly line is part of that process of experimentation. But what he did is he, he learned that, hey, wait, this practice of the time, which is for laborers to work six hours for 12 hours a day is not optimal. What actually is optimal is a 40 hour work week for five days only. Now, he, he spun this as a great boon for the labor class. It would allow for all kinds of other wonderful things to happen in the economy. And he was right there too, but by and large, what he did was he made a lot of people mad he made a lot of industrial industrialists upset because they were gonna now have to match what Ford was doing. But Ford didn't do this because he was altruistic. Ford did it because he had been experimenting for 12 years and he'd learned that if he scaled back the number of hours that the uh, laborers would work, they made fewer mistakes and they ended up with the same output. And so it cost him less to have him work for five days it cost him less because of fewer defects. So we've known for a century 
that working 50, 60 plus hours over prolonged periods of time does not produce more or even better quality output. In fact, it does the opposite. And this was repeated in more modern times with Microsoft in the 90s. When they released Windows 98, they were there were 28,000 bugs on the day it was released, and they had a project plan to address them on the day it was released. The time pressures that Microsoft put on all of their engineers to get work done on time produced a scarcity mindset that saw them not fix a significant number of problems before release. And again, Microsoft said, oh, this isn't good. So they did some things. A, they adopted Agile, but they also learned to set more realistic timetables and they began to constrain the number of hours their engineers were working for the simple fact that more hours did not, over sustained periods of time, produce quality output that they could scale back the number of hours their employees work without sacrificing output. Doesn't mean that you can't do overtime, just means that persistent overtime does not help. Now, there are a few things that we can do, best practices in the organizational culture business to, to, to pay some attention to this and, and begin to get productivity up and, and work hours down. The first is, well, we got to talk about it. What, what, gets, what gets discussed gets, gets measured and what gets measured gets changed. Leaders, HR people, we got to talk about task management. It needs to be part of our OKRs, part of our performance management system, whatever it is we're using. We need to have a window into the workload of our team and we need to be aware that if they're working too many hours, they're probably not delegating as much as they should. And if your managers are not delegating as much as they should, they're not being as efficient with the team as they could be. They are suffering and their teams are also suffering. Talk about task management, help them delegate. Now, like any, any, any process of improvement, we gotta know if our efforts are gonna do anything. So there's two things that we can do. A, we, we need to be asking the employees through surveys, hey, like, what are we doing? Are we on the right track here? Are, are our efforts to help you, you know, balance your work a little, working, uh, working life here better? Are you getting more done? Do you feel better? We need to provide small little rewards for managers and for others to, who delegate successfully. Some small little, you know, ribbons or some sort of recognition program that up, up, up can provide. Um, but we need in some way to say, good job for delegating all that work and you know ensuring that they, that work gets done well. And then once it's all done, well, better repeat. Then we gotta talk about task management all over again. How can we get better at this? This is the, the not particularly secret, not particularly magic approach that needs to be done if you want operational efficiency in your organization. Now, how do you actually get started though? Well, this is where behavioral science comes in we, uh, there's a term that behavioral scientists coined called a nudge. Now, a nudge is not training. A nudge is an intervention that changes the context in which a decision gets made. So a really simple coping strategy here, for example, for those of you that are using Google uh, or even Microsoft uh, email servers, here's, here's one thing you could do relatively easily. You can go into your Google Analytics and you can find out how many emails are being sent outside of work hours to colleagues or customers. Now, once you have that information, make a dashboard out of it. Show it to the leadership team. Show the managers. Here's how many messages you're sending. Now, well, hopefully this won't backfire. There are some circumstances where it can happen. Uh, but if most people are not sending out messages after work hours, but are doing it in whatever their time zone dependent, for sake of simplicity, assume there's no time zone, but if they're, if they're sending it on, mostly during work hours and there's only three or four that are not, now that principle of relatedness comes back in. Peer pressure. Nobody else is working all these, all these additional hours. Why am I? What you'll find in those circumstances is just showing what everybody else is doing 
can lead to 20 to 30 percent declines in out of work outside of work time activities. Now it could be that that managers are getting smart and they're using email schedulers to send it the next working day, but that's also good. That also will nudge the organization in the right direction. That's one thing we can do. But if you're still firefighting, if you're still finding that too many of your employees are working 50, 60, 70 hours a week, you're productive, you're trying to, to find the solution, but you just can't find Slack, bring someone outside into your team to take a look at your workflows and, and find a way to get better quality work done in fewer hours without sacrificing output. Bring in an outside consultant like St. Johns Hopkins did in the United States. So that, folks, brings us to the end of today's presentation. I'll conclude with, if you can design your work life better, meaning if you can include some free time, give yourself an hour a week at least to look out the window and, and think about what's going on. This is your strategy time. This is your creative time. You need this. You need this slack. It will, it will feel at first to be the most useless exercise you can think of. But if you're trying to, if you, just like as we're trying to get in shape or diet better, you need rest in order to be, to work at peak capacity. The same is true cognitively. Your brain needs that time to free think. It'll allow you to absorb additional tasks that come in through some emergency with a client or some product breakdown that takes place. You will need that slack, but if you design for it, you'll get more work done with even having an, a, an hour less in the week. If you wanna hear a little bit more about the topic of behavioral science and how it might apply to business, I've got some resources here available for you. So you can go to my YouTube channel, which is BCX Design. I've got uh, maybe about 20 odd videos there on the topic of design and be in, uh, designing organizations. You can also follow me on, uh, on LinkedIn or, or my Facebook page where I also post that content. If you'd like an actual consultation, my phone number and my email address are also here. So I thank you very much for for listening to me. I'll, I'll flip back over to uh, to the to the presentation to the uh, you know to the the conference room so we can have a Q and A. But I will post this on my on my LinkedIn page as well as my Facebook page. So if any of you are interested and want to go learn where much of the material came for today's presentation, you can please find it you'll find this available for you tomorrow you can click on any of these references and find that information for now though let me uh let me swing back to our presentation over here and see if there are any questions that i should be answering okay wow um you know i just want to say david um you talked before about paint it forward right so I, I think I speak for everyone in the move up team and everyone in the audience when I say thank you for paying it forward with what you have learned, David. <laughs> um, before we move on, I have uh, just a couple of shout outs. Um, Miss Mai Va is watching us. So uh, hi, Miss Mai. Miss um, Heidlin from the Philippine National Police is also watching with us. Um, we have over 100 people watching live in the move up page and in addition to that we have over 20 watch parties with even more people watching so um yeah so shout out to everyone watching um if you want to see more engaging content like this uh please do like the the move up page uh, and subscribe to the hr channel in the move up app all right so we'll be inviting david back in just a moment for the q a section um, but first, who would like to know about a certificate? I think most people would, right? So um, there is a certificate available for today. We have created a course with David available in the Move Up app um, later this week. Okay, so head to the Move Up app, subscribe to the HR channel, and you will be able to complete this course. Uh, on employee engagement, a focus on delegation. Um, if you don't yet have MoveUp, you can go to prx.ph slash get MoveUp to download the app on iOS or Android. And if you're thinking, uh, I really wanna use this app for my company, you can create your own learning community 
in move up so um if you'd like to hear more about that you can email me on jamie at upupapp.asia and maybe you're wondering what exactly is move up watch this video to find out Just a reminder, guys, please don't go anywhere. We still have the Q&A section where you can ask your questions, so start thinking now. Uh, and we still have the prize to win at the end. Okay, so before we go on, I'd like to give a huge thank you again to all our partners, and especially a big thank you to our co-organizer for this event, Uprush, who have launched their first ever fully online HR bootcamp. Check out this video for more information. <music> All right. And like I said, don't go anywhere. We still have the prize to win for today. Um, as a reminder, this is worth 25,000 pesos. And today you will get it for free. You will have access to our exclusive training content available only in MoveUp. We have topics like um, how to upscale your productivity. We have leadership, many, 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 many more. All right. So stay tuned to find out how to win the prize. All right, now I'd like to invite back our fantastic speaker, um, Mr. David McCann for our Q&A section. So uh, David, I know I have <laughs> I have so many notes <laughs> and that's only one page. <laughs> but um, maybe I'd like to take a question first from the audience. I'm sure they have lots of questions as well. Um, so I see one here, David, from Shay. Um, Shay asks, uh, what do you think is the purpose of an employee engagement survey? So I saw that question and I've been thinking about it for, for a couple of minutes. Now, there, there are some, let's call them more obvious or more direct reasons that we'd want to ask people what they think. So when we're, when we're asking whether it's employees or customers, what do they think about an experience that we just, that you just had? So it might be, we created a new employee platform for them to go book their holidays or, or, or manage some other, or ask for some other permission, for example. We wanna know that what we're asking, what we, well, we don't know what we're building, I should say, for people is actually working, doing what's intended, but we also wanna know how they felt about an experience that we just had. And there's a reason that I think, I think you actually spoke to it in your last presentation, Jamie, it's that recency. Mm -hmm. If we ask somebody how they felt about a thing that they just did, be it using a product or or having a conversation with somebody, uh, or you know just experiencing the way that the company is is making a change, we know how they remember things. Now, we want to know how people remember things because it'll tell us a the the mood of the team. If they're not feeling particularly good. Well, that's a, an early warning signal for for the leadership or management in a company to to think about making some changes, be they changes to how they've communicated something or or how they design something for them in the future. An employee engagement survey is 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 a way of kind of taking the mood of of, a, of an organization, if you might say that. And so, understanding how the people in our organization, in our charge, or who are we responsible for, are feeling hopefully will help us be better leaders. And so we really do want to know what employees think. Is is that helpful for you, Shay? Does that get to the root of what you wanted to know? 
Um, we'll, we'll see if she replies again in the in the comment section, but uh, I think that answers the question, <laughs> David. Um, I have another question here from uh, Joham. Um, what is your idea about employee index? Uh, how important is it in an employee engagement relation? Are we talking about a benchmark here? I'm not quite um, sure what, you know, what we mean by employee index. I'm not quite familiar with it, David. Um, all right, let's let's go to some questions about uh, Slack, right? I, I had some questions about Slack. Mm. So how about in a startup environment? How, how can we introduce Slack in a startup environment? Because, you know, everyone is wearing so many hats and you always have, to, your schedule is always full, basically. Um, so what would be your, your advice for that one? Well, listen, don't get me wrong. I love Slack. I really do. I use it all the time. I use it with my clients. The, the advantages to a tool like that are, listen, when you're a startup, you don't have policies, product information, a list of contact information of all the people that you might need to know in any centralized place. And I can tell you having worked in enterprise for a very long time that having how you do a task, who you talk to if you have a problem, what the rules are, are really uh, big time savers that help promote autonomy. It means you don't need your manager. And Slack, in a way, serves as a kind of centralized repository. If you have a project team that's communicating exclusively through Slack, you will have transparency into a project. You'll know, A, who's, who's doing a lot of work. It'll, it'll likely nudge you to maybe work a little bit harder. So introducing Slack is a really great way to improve collaboration. Now, the, the challenges with Slack are unfortunately gonna fall on, on the individual at this point, because I, I have yet to find a centralized way of doing this other than by nudging people to do it. We will get distracted. We will get pulled back into work every time we have Slack open on our phones if we're out having lunch on a Sunday afternoon and we're enjoying the, the enjoying the day and someone's doing a thing Sunday morning and we've got Slack enabled and, and maybe that's fine. Maybe they're in Dubai and, and Sunday is a work day. We see it for 20 minutes. We're now going to go, no, 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 it's Sunday. I'm having lunch. Things are great. I'm not going to pay attention to that. But you are paying attention to it. Not fully consciously but you are thinking about it while you're enjoying your time. And so you're brought back into work. And so one of the more powerful things you can do in a startup environment to force yourself and hopefully nudge others to switch off, at least for windows of time, turn it off. Throw a reminder on your phone to turn off that notification setting from Slack at a certain point, set it out of office, there is a reason that most of our phones and, and communication tools have out of office tools. Many of us don't use them properly. If I'll tell you what I did uh, when I first when I first started using Slack about five years ago, I was working with an Indian project team, and what I did was I made them configure Slack, download it, and set it up in the meeting. So we set notifications, the out of offices to be off at a certain point in the meeting. We, we began to use it in that meeting itself so we could begin to form that habit. But that's, that's what I would suggest, Jamie. I hope that's helpful. Yeah, sure. So here we're talking about the, we're talking about the, the tool rather than the oh. Slack is not giving you leeway. <laughs> <laughs> wow, that was bad, I'm sorry. Okay. <laughs> Okay, it, it's really easy. With time-saving Slack, you need an hour. I don't care where you put it, but you need an hour in your regular work week somewhere that is purely dedicated to whatever time. This is not you watching Netflix or have an extra lunch. This is you at your desk doing work stuff that's completely unstructured for an hour. This is not tasks that are currently assigned to you. This is your blue sky thinking time. This is time you need. That needs to be there in every week. Schedule it. Let no meeting be booked there. If Paul calls you and says, Jamie, we gotta have a <laughs> you say, no, Paul, no, Paul. 
we're not doing it then. We're I joke. <laughs> <laughs> no one says no to Paul. <laughs> joke, 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 jokes. Um, so yeah, no, I, I agree on your um, your points, both on the the leeway and the the tool as well. Also, it's 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 a great great tool to have. Um, so one of my my glamorous assistant in the background, um, Miss Miss Tony, has just said that. Um, uh, employee engagement index it is an online survey in which employees assess their own engagement at work there we go um paul just commented saying i heard that <laughs> <laughs> so it's what i suspected then so if we're talking we're talking about benchmarking a way to know um johanna i think we're talking about how engaged you are versus how the rest of the organization is engaged so if that's the right assumption, and, and forgive me, this is a new term to me, being able to compare yourself is a type of, uh, of social pressure. In, in behavioral landscape, in the behavioral science landscape, we're talking about what are called social norms. So think of it like if everybody else is great and you are not, might that make you more engaged or might that make you feel worse about yourself? Well, um, it honestly depends on the boss. Now, to, to be frank about it, if you've got a terrible boss, but all of your peers say, hey, the boss is terrible, the, the odds of them sticking with that company are actually better if everybody hates the boss. You'll do your work longer. You'll just have the opportunity to be with each other and say how much you dislike the boss. And, and that sort of bonding gives you a way to, how shall I describe? Uh, it, it gives you a way to cope with your situation a bit better because you're all suffering. If though you compare yourself to your peers and you find out that you are nowhere near as engaged as your peers are, it's possible that it, it might make you, uh, how shall we say, if you respect your peers, it might make the barriers come down a little bit. Maybe you'll, you'll begin to look a little bit more carefully. Perhaps you'll introspect and maybe begin to change some of your opinions and maybe even some of your habits will change and maybe you'll become more engaged. It's possible. It's also possible if the boss is awful and they're all really, really great, you're doomed that would make you pretty well leave the company. So I think my, 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 my idea on, on the employee index is, uh, listen, dashboards of this type are, are tricky. In, in cert, with certain teams and in certain organizational cultures, um, dashboards can hurt more than they can help. For example, if you're a competitive sales team and you're all doing kind of okay, um, a dashboard will probably encourage competition to get tougher and people will end up bringing their performance up. But if you're in a team that's more focused on learning, so let's say you're in a product or an engineering team and you're building something new and, and you just don't, like you don't know what the solution is or, or you're an L&D team or like some kind of team that's not so competitive, if you put a dashboard in place, it, it's probably going to hurt the organization or the team more than it's going to help them. People are not used to seeing their performance on how happy they are compared to everybody else. So I, I would be cautious about just bringing dashboards, even things like employee indexes to, to everybody because they're not going to work uniformly well. Mm. Agreed. Um, so while we, David, we have so many questions, um, I think this is probably one of the most uh, interactive sessions we, we've had so far. So um, congratulations on drawing in such a crowd. We really appreciate it. <laughs> mm. um, all right. Uh, so I have a comment here. Shay says, um, Sir David, I think you're a good boss. Okay. So <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. How about the next question? Um, yes. Um, Larido asks, is there any system or methods use for delegating to employees or, or what would be your um your recommended way to to go about delegation 
oh man, there's a whole there's a whole world of solutions out there. So from an enterprise perspective, if you were to look at um, let's say like some workforce workforce automation tools like SAP and Oracle have some great solutions in that space. So really think of it like in let's say we're talking about startup to startup to enterprise. At startup level, we're talking about Trello on the free end of things. SAP and Oracle at the, the enterprise end of the spectrum. The concept is you need to know what tasks are in front of you in whatever job you have. And the reason that you need to do that is most project managers would know is there's no way you're gonna remember everything you have to do. You're no way, there's no way that you're gonna remember easily who you've delegated everything to already or know who's got the right capabilities to handle what tasks you have in front of them. That takes a lot of bandwidth and, and frankly, most of us don't have it. So a tool like a Trello becomes the reference point where you can go to your day and you can say, okay, well, um, if you're a marketing manager or a sales manager, you can look at all the clients that you're targeting or trying to reach right now. If you're an engineering manager, you can look at your uh, your project board, your whiteboard, if that's what you use, and you can see, hey, here's all the work that I have to do. But when it comes to the actual task of delegating, frankly, Trello or project management tools are great resources. They allow you to say, I gave this thing to David, this thing to Paul, this thing to Jamie, mm -hmm. and these tasks are all due on date X, Y, and Z. For those of you that have been around, have enough gray, you may have come across a term called smart. Um, whenever you delegate a thing, it's gotta be specific and measurable. You've gotta know, hey, listen, if I've given a thing, or if Jamie's given David a thing, Jamie's gotta know when David's gonna get it done, mm -hmm. and he's gotta have clarity into where I am with that job. This is how he ensures control and how he builds trust in me. And there are many, many, many solutions out there, but if you're looking for a free one just to see how it works in practice, go watch the Trello video. It's pretty informative. You might also, if you're really, if you're in the enterprise world, you might go look at uh, workforce management solutions or performance management solutions. Um, at a at a maybe more pen and paper level, OKRs can be used to help you with delegation as well. Particularly if you're trying to ensure that your managers are in fact delegating, you can you can check into that after they make after you the junior manager make commitments to delegate. I don't know, whatever, 40% of your tasks, you would now are making yourself accountable to your to your bigger boss. But this is a topic that I could talk about for like an hour. I hope this small little tidbit was helpful. Sure, yeah, I think, um, I, I swear also by Trello because um, it allows you to see see at a glance where where is a project. Um, and also allows for transparency, which I think is really important because you don't want to be, you know, messaging, 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 asking for updates, you can see on the Trello board um, at what stage is the project and uh, where is David, what has David done so far as he moved it to the next part. So um, yeah, I, I agree, guys, please um, check out Trello. Um, I also use Sorted um, in my, it's a Gmail extension, very similar, it's like a Kanban board. And on the premium version, you can assign a task to, to someone else. So it works very similar to Trello. Um, we have some questions from Ms. Mai Vo. Um, mm. Ms. Mai, she is the um, former HRPB director from Cargill, so she's a HR master. Uh, she spoke with us before. Um, she's asking some questions about Slack, David, the, um, the off-time version, not the uh, <laughs> application. Um, so is going to the spa and switching off the TV, uh, your, your phone, Slack time? So, hang on a second. So I was looking at her first question, which is Slack time is similar to buffer time in project management versus go to spa and switch off. So <laughs> yes, in both cases, yes, the answer is yes. It's, it's buffer time. Uh, using that example of the hospital that I gave, creating a space that was unbookable, which was there for you to do your, your broad thinking, that's Slack and it, it, I wouldn't necessarily define Slack in a professional day as going to the spa and getting a massage. Maybe, maybe, maybe that's, that's okay. But I think 
I, I would think of it more within, if I'm going to define it as a 40 hour work week, I'm going to define Slack to be a window of time in that work time where you are not on task, where you have flexibility to think big and or handle emergencies that come. So in, in sales language, in, in, retail, in retail environments, like in banks, uh, we call this walk-in time. It's where you're just not allowed to book anything. You might get lucky and have a couple of hours to catch up on paperwork, which will let you do more marketing and more sales. Um, and whatever language you use in whatever organization you, you, you're involved with, um, having that flexibility to not book yourself is really important. And I wanna just add one more thing here if I could, Jamie. Yes, please do, David. So the Pomodoro Tracker is also a really helpful tool to help keep us on track so that we don't find our, our busy time bleed into that slack. So the, the classic example of this is when we are in sales mode and we're trying to meet with uh, a senior decision maker, CEO or someone like that, uh, they have a gatekeeper. They have an executive assistant and a really good executive assistant's job is in part, make sure that you are on track. For example, maybe the CEO is like me, like to talk way too much. <laughs> love people can very easily take a 30 minute conversation and make it a 90 minute conversation. What a Pomodoro tracker does is akin to what a really great executive assistant does. Executive assistant with that really chatty CEO who's his own worst enemy will have a knock at the door five minutes out from, from his EA and he'll be saying, hey boss, five minutes. And then he'll come in at that window, open the door and say, hey, you know, time's up. That's what a Pomodoro tracker does. But in effect, it's just digitizing a solution to help keep us on track. So while yes, I'm sorry I've taken this a bit long, Mai, but the idea is yes, we need buffer. It's called Slack in, in the behavioral science lens language, but they're effectively the same concept. But in addition to putting that in your time and, and not letting anybody book in there, these Pomodoro trackers, will help keep you on track so that you don't spend, you don't dally. Mm. So can I, if I may, I, I know we're running over, but um, I'm really, really interested in this topic. Um, for the, the Pomodoro method, um, mm. would we have the Slack representing a Pomodoro bro block or does the Slack represent the break in the middle? I don't know if Slack has an extension. Um, I use the Pom a Pomodoro tool. The, if you Google Pomodoro, I think it's pomodoro-tracker.com. Mm -hmm. um, and I've used it as a standalone app that sits on my desktop. Um, but in theory, if there's an extension in Slack that lets you put your calendar in there and all the tasks that you're working on, and there is because you can sync it to Trello, uh, mm -hmm. yeah, in theory, you could use Slack as a Pomodoro tracker. Mm. No, uh, what, I, what I mean, David, is... Um... Should the, the leeway time be a block in and of itself? Oh, yeah. 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 Got you. Mm -mm. Super. Sorry. <laughs> no, no problem, David. Um, right. So that's pretty much all we have time for. So um, I think can everyone in the comment section um, please join me in writing your thanks to David for, for today. So um, thank you, David, from um, from Move Up, from Praxis, from... Um, Uprush and Jandy and all our co-organizers for um, joining us today. And I, we really, really hope that we will be able to see you soon, David. My um, pleasure. Thank you for having me. You're welcome. And if anyone, any, any of you guys watching want to continue the conversation or, or you want to book David for a consultation, um, please reach out to him. Um, we will post some uh, details in the comments section on how you can reach David already. So um, as I said before, we will be back the same time next week. Now, uh, next week, we will be joined by Miss um, Mikael Jakob. She is the Vice President of Legal and HR in Family Medical Practice here in Vietnam. Uh, and she's going to be sharing a bit about uh, HR management in uncertain times. Um, I think, Miss Tony, you can flash a registration link. There we go. So please head to prx.ph slash HR What's Next Reg. Um, 
David, I'm sure you can see all the comments are coming in now. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. <laughs> um, in addition to that, we have launched a new webinar series um, starting on Wednesday, the 4th of November called Marketing, What's Next? So the idea behind this series is we want to help um, the marketing community on things like trends, technology, performance, automation, media creatives. We're going to have some thought leaders sharing some best practices. So if you would like to register for tickets, they're free. Uh, go to prx.pa slash MKT reg. There we go. prx.ph slash MKT reg. I always get mixed up between slash and dash. So I have to do the actions. <laughs> Um, in addition to that, we have another webinar featuring Mr. Paul Espinas. Um, Paul will be talking about how to manage your workforce efficiently, um, along with uh, Mr. Matthew Lowry and Steve Jones. Um, this will be tomorrow, and you can register on bit.ly slash manage workforce reg. All right. Lastly, it's time to win the prize. Okay, so I will ask a question. The first person to write the answer in the comment section, you will win the prize. All right, so the question is, what is the name of the app where you will claim your certificate for today's session? Again, what is the name of the app where you will claim your certificate for today's session? Just while we're waiting for the winner to come in, um, this will give you access to 25,000 pesos worth of master classes. And then we have a winner. Um, the winner is Rossel Santos. So congratulations. One of our correspondents will reach out to you in social media and send you some instructions for how to uh, claim your prize. So thank you so much, everybody. All right. Lastly, a lot of people have asked, how do I claim my certificate for today's session? Uh, you can do this through the MoveUp app. <clears throat> if you have not downloaded already, you can go to moveup.page.link slash get dash app or watch this video to find out. Thank you for learning with us. Here are the steps to claim your certificates. Step one. Go to Google Play Store if you are using an Android device, or you can go to Apple App Store if you're using an iPhone. There, you can download Move Up app. Step 2. Head to the Browse tab and select Channels to see all the channels available on Move Up. Choose the channel you want to subscribe to and click the Subscribe button to access all the courses in the channel. Step 3. Access your My Learning tab to see all the channels that you have subscribed to. Inside the channel, you can select the course and click Begin. You will have a short pre-quiz to check your prior knowledge. Don't worry if you don't pass. Step 4. After key lessons, you will have the opportunity to answer the questions again. Make sure to answer carefully. You must score over 70% to be eligible for a certificate. Once all the lessons are completed, and if you have scored over 70% in the post-lesson tests, a button will appear to generate your certificate. If you have any difficulties, please contact us through our social media pages or email us at admin at upupapp.asia. Thank you for moving up with us. All right, if you have any problems uh, with claiming your, your certificate, you can reach out to us on our social media page. So head to m.me slash up, up, app, Asia. All right, and send us a direct message. With that, that's all we have time for. So I'd like to extend a huge thank you to our speaker for today, Mr. David McCann. Again, we will post his details so you can reach out to him if you'd like some more information or if you want to continue the conversation. And thank you, of course, to everyone watching. This has been, uh, I've been Jamie, and this has been HR. What's next? See you next time. <laughs>